Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. I'm Tamara Pesic. Welcome to the Visiting Speaker Series. Thank you so much for coming out and joining us. Um, I've been very much looking forward to our guest today, Marianne Allison, um, out, of here from, out here from the great state of Brooklyn. And <clears throat> the fair state, the beautiful state, the innovative and practical state. Um, I met Marianne, oh, I don't know, over a year ago now uh, at, a, at a function in New York, and she started telling me a little bit about the work that, that she was doing in social change and uh, her, her work in her PhD that she had just finished up um, at NYU. And she would say a sentence, and then I would say, you have to come out to Microsoft. And then she would tell me about another project that she was doing. And I would say, no, no, you have to come out to Microsoft. So um, I've, I've been telling her that she has to come out to Microsoft for for a long time now, and so I'm so pleased that she was able to make time in her schedule this fall. Um, she's a professor. She runs uh, the Allison Consulting Group. Um, she used to be a vice president at Citibank. Uh, she's a New York State poet um, and a list of other incredible accomplishments. Uh, so I'm just so excited to have such a polymath with us here to talk about understanding customers and her heuristics for understanding customers I think are incredibly informative uh, for the age that we are working in. So please help me welcome Marianne Allison. Hi folks, I got to, so can you all hear? Yeah? Okay. So I, I got to meet a couple of you and I hope to meet some more of you afterwards. I'm really, really pleased to be here. I've been looking forward to this for as long as Tam has, since she first mentioned it. And one of the reasons that I'm really interested to be here is because I think you have, well, you have many challenges, but a couple of challenges that are particularly interesting to me. Um, the one that I'm going to focus on today is the fact that I believe that you are developing products and marketing to customers who are simultaneously living in at least two, maybe three, different historical periods. So that the social ages of your customers are different. And when a person lives in a different social age, even though they might actually live in the same house or apartment, they think differently. They have different conceptual capabilities. They form different kinds of organizations. They have different needs, and they have very different skills. So I thought it would be interesting to talk some about that. And when I was thinking about how I might start, I was thinking of my father, who was born in 1921. My father was a very smart man, a uh, uh, medical doctor. Uh, specialized twice, once as a burn specialist and second as a psychiatrist. And I remember him later in life sitting in the living room, looking at TV, watching movies, and getting just furious. And eventually turning them off because he couldn't understand jump cuts. He didn't, he didn't grow up in a time when, he grew up in a time when there weren't many movies, and then when there were movies, people, you know, came out the door, walked down the steps, got in the car, drove down the street, got to the airport, got out of the car. We would like be so gone with this movie, right? I mean, we would be so gone, we couldn't stand it. But he couldn't make sense out of movies that did jump cuts. So we have the good fortune and the challenge of living in a time of very high social change. 
right? So that pretty much everything that happens in our society now is changing. Andrew Stern, who's the president of the Service Employees Union, says that he thinks this is the most significant and transformative economic change ever to happen in the world of work. The National Security site, if you go to the, the website of our National Security Council, you'll see a thing that says, you know what? We were pretty much prepared to defend against nations, but we're not fighting nations. Conquering nations aren't the problem, right? Um, so we have a different kind of group that we're fighting with. When Beloit College in Wisconsin and Sarah Lawrence in New York and the University of California degender all of their restrooms, because students have lobbied to say that there are 10 to 12 percent of us who don't fit neatly in male and female. We're asexual, bisexual, transgender, gay, lesbian, and a number of other things. And this isn't right, the way we have it so neatly structured into two, two sexes. The world is changing. When I had a tumor a couple of years ago, a fairly sizable tumor that fortunately turned out not to be malignant, something else was, was changing. When I came into my doctor's office, I came in with printouts from around the web of all the things that I'd researched. And so my doctor, George Lombardi, who's a great doctor, was no longer the only expert in the room, right? So the nature of authority and information is changing. So absolutely everything about our society is changing. It isn't just that there's a little pile of changes that are unrelated. They're related to each other. This is a systemic change in society. And this has happened before. Right? We've had systemic changes in society before. So the nature of my research, I started in 1992 when Howard Rheingold wrote a book called Virtual Community. And I thought, ooh, what a cool idea. Um, and I wanted to talk about it. And there was no way to talk about community. This was about the same time that GM said, you know, you buy my car and come to my website, you're part of my community. And I said, well, I don't mind buying your car and coming to your website, but it doesn't really feel like a community to me. So what is a community? So I started out with a research question, you know, can there be such a thing as virtual community? And that took me down the path of looking at the earlier studies of what is community. That led me to Marx and Ternays and Weber and Durkheim and for those folks of you who've taken sociology, who were the first people to study community. And what became clear to me when I was looking at their work was that they were actually studying community because there was a systemic change going on then. And that was the Industrial Revolution. These folks were phenomenal observers. And they painted a picture of society before the Industrial Revolution and the society that was then emerging during their lifetimes after the Industrial Revolution. And it was completely different. Not just a few things different. There was a complete change in the societal system. Ternes, who was one of the most brilliant of these observers, labeled the time before the Industrial Revolution Gemeinschaft and the time after the Industrial Revolution Gesellschaft. Any of you know those words? A couple? Okay. So I came to the conclusion that the Information Revolution is as powerful or maybe even more powerful than the Industrial Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution. And then we have a new age emerging now in Western civilization. I'm just starting to look at the rest of the world. So everything that I'm going to talk about today is, is really confined to <laughs> the rather broad scope of, of Western civilization. So I have named the time period now emerging after the information revolution in their honor, Gesellschaft. It's not a German word. It's an American made up word. Um, so. <clears throat> Let me say a little bit now about how this social change worked. When Marx and Dirk and Turnes and Durkheim were talking about it, they talked about it as oppositional. 
So there was Gemeinschaft or village society and there was Gesellschaft or bureaucratic society and they were sort of in opposition to each other. In fact, social change looks exactly like the pattern that we see in the biological record in the fossils. So that what we see is a long period of early life and then there's a system reorganization and then there's a long period of fish and then there's a reorganization and then there's a long period of dinosaurs and then mammals and then hominids and like that. Well human society does that too. So that there was a long period when we were hunter-gatherers and then there was a systemic change. Everything about society changed after human beings started using agriculture. The way our families worked, the way our business worked, the way the economy worked. Um, and there were some other things that, that happened as well, but everything changed. Family structure, status, everything. So after the Industrial Revolution, another change. And now with the Information Revolution, another change. Now one of the things about this change is that it's not instantaneous so that the bureaucratization, you know, the making of Gesellschaft around Western society took about 250 years. So in 1710 it started in England and Scotland, but it didn't start in Russia till about 1910. So right now we're seeing different levels of the older society, Gesellschaft, and the newer society, Gesibershaft, present in our world. Right? We see a lot of the tension between them. That makes sense? And by the way, I don't think they are better or worse. They're different. There are advantages to both. As we go through society, there's more freedom. As we go back in time, there's more intimacy and closeness. Right? So it's not that they're better or worse. They're just different. <clears throat> so. What I'd like to do is to do three things. I'd like to talk about some examples of these changes so that you can carry that away in your heads and, and be able to look at things. Then I'd like to talk about groups. And then I'd like to talk about what I think of myself as Microsoft's karma in the matter. Um, I think you have some karma and a very big role to play. So let me do that. So, I want to talk about three social periods, Gemeinschaft or village life, Gesellschaft or bureaucratic life, and Gesibershaft or the information age life that we're just experiencing now. And let's talk about status and how status changed. So, suppose that you lived in a village in, say, the 1600s, and let's put it in England, and your name is John Barleycorn and you're a peasant. You are born into your status. You can't become a king. Doesn't matter. That's it. You're born. Doesn't matter how smart you are. Doesn't matter how good you might be at it. That's what you're going to be. You're going to be a peasant. On the other hand, then there's Charles II, who wasn't a particularly good king, and he didn't get to become a peasant either. Right? He got to have his head chopped off, but he didn't get to become a peasant. So status was inherited, or what's called described. After the Industrial Revolution, status started to change. So that it, if you were born a peasant, as my family pretty much was, you could actually go to school. You could work hard in a bureaucracy. You could get a degree. You could get a managerial position. You could work in a government. So your status could be determined by achievement. Now one of the interesting things about societal change is that the old one doesn't completely go away. So it still mattered if you might be born to a Rockefeller. But it really mattered your achievement. So what's happening now? So status is changing again. After the information revolution, which is still very much going on, we're seeing a new form of status happening. And that is assessment. So think Amazon. And not only official book reviewers, but anybody can review, and then people can review the reviewers. Or think eBay. 
and buyers and sellers stars or think LinkedIn and endorsements. So what's happening is that it's mattering less what school you went to and more what you do. Still matters what school you went to because we're close to that time period in time, but assessment is mattering more and more and more. Another example would be governance. So think about a village, 150 people. How is a village governed? It's governed by social pressure. Somebody does something wrong, there's a lot of pressure on that person and it's no joke. So eventually, if you don't conform to village norms, you get thrown out of the village and you die. So it's, it's um, pretty powerful. After we got to the point where people were moving from village to village, right? After the Industrial Revolution, there was more transportation. There was a lot of more communication. We grew cities. So suppose Tam here and I are on opposite sides of a street corner in the city and I don't know her and she's doing something wrong and I frown at her. Poof, what does she care? Right? There's no village headman. She doesn't know who I am. I don't know who she is. She's going to go on doing it. So once we got larger groups, we needed to develop police forces and courts and um, all those kinds of things. Well, now, after the information revolution, what's happening to the laws and the courts and the police forces in terms of keeping order in the world? They're way stretched, right? They can't keep up, not fast enough. And who has jurisdiction? So when I do business, as I do in Saudi Arabia and in Scotland and wherever else, if they don't pay me, what am I going to do? Go to small claims court? Absolutely not. What small claims court? Right? And who is it that's thinking of inter you know, regulating the internet? So what's happening is we're developing new forms of governance. And one of the new forms of governance is transparency or making things visible. And another is trust. Not trust in a normative, uh, warm and comfy, think highly of me, but trust because you have no choice. The only people in Saudi Arabia that I'll do business with are the people that I trust to do business with me. And if you look at websites, you start to see Vera signs and privacy signs and things that say, trust me, trust me, right? Because you can't go down and look at the building and see whether you think the business is trustworthy. So the shape of this change over time, not only are there punctuation points, but there's an overall shape. And that shape is faster, more autonomous, more use of information, and increasing distance from the constraints of the physical. So let me give you a couple of examples. And while I'm doing that, you can think about how these things apply. So let's take attention. In village life, you're a farmer. You planted. You could look at the horizon. You could daydream. You could talk to somebody next to you. You could, attention was pretty diffuse, right? And pretty natural. After the Industrial Revolution, then you had to be focused. You had to read and write. You had to concentrate. You had to do one thing at a time. We put kids in schools and said, sit still, don't move, don't look at the horizon, don't daydream. Right? Focus on one thing. Now, that doesn't work anymore because there's too much information. We're submerged in electronic communications and information, so now we need to multitask. Right? And actually, some studies of the brains of younger children who've been born into this new age, who only have lived when there are cell phones and the internet and pervasive communications, just because I don't multitask well, they can multitask well. They have that capability. So my guess is that some of you here will be actually pretty good at that as well. And that's because you'll have learned some assimilation skills, right, when you come into the, the new land. So that's one example 
Another example would be decision making. When you made a decision in a village, you made it pretty slowly. You made it not very autonomously. You followed folk ways, right? You did sort of what the culture said to do. Then we had the Industrial Revolution and decision making changed. The way that people started to make decisions was based on logic and scientific method and rational observation. A quite different way of making a decision than how did my father do it. Quite different. Now we're seeing again a new way of making decisions. And that new way of making decisions is to say what is the purpose for which I am making the decision and that will help me think about how I might make the decision. So it's purpose-based decision making. And it often includes more than one set of perspectives and ideas. So decision making and attention faster, more complex, more autonomous, meaning less tied to things, more use of information, and very much further from the constraints of the physical. Filing is another really good example. In village life, there wasn't anything to file. You might have a book or two, an A piece of paper, maybe. Then in the industrial age, we had file cabinets, right? That's when I grew up with big file cabinets and lots of file cabinets. In fact, I was so excited when we got Penaflex files because you could slide them back and forth and it made it easier. But I'm a terrible filer. I am really awful. I make too many categories. I don't remember what I put things in. And I mutter, right, <laughs> while I can't find things. And then along comes, you know, folks like Microsoft, and now I have a laptop, and I have new files, right? And that's how people explained to me how I was going to save information was I was going to put them in files. So I'm still a terrible filer. I make too many virtual folders, right? I can't find things. I mutter. So I'm muttering the other day, and my assistant, who is... Uh, a great leader of a rock band and um, we have part-time folks who are, who are artists and uh, he's listening to me mutter and he's saying, but Marianne, why don't you search for it? I said, no, 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 search takes too long. And two seconds later, he has the file on my computer. See, I think of my computer as a physical thing, right? And the files on my computer as physical files. He doesn't file anything, nothing. All he does is search. He doesn't think of them as physical. I think of them as physical, even if they're not, even if they're virtual. Right? And you can you do different things with physical and with virtual. We also find mates differently. So my ten times great grandmother, Gertie Van Doyen, lived in Brooklyn. She was one of the first settlers. She lived about six miles from where I live now. And, you know, what she ate was corn and wheat and corn and wheat. And the house she lived in was pretty plain. And her clothes were really heavy wool and, if she was lucky, some cotton. And I live in a loft. Um, and I can have, you know, Chinese, Indian, Thai, Mexican, and a bunch of other things delivered in 20 minutes. And... Uh, I have miracle fabrics, right? But those are the physical things, and those aren't the most important things. So how did she find a mate? Well, there were three choices, right? So the person who she got along with best of the three possible choices, right? There was like no love in this. There was, that was the choice. So how did I find a mate? I have a 34-year marriage, one of the best things I did in my life. So by the time I met my husband, I'd probably met about 1,000 young men. This was in the 60s and 70s. And in the industrial, after the Industrial Revolution, we had this notion of romantic love, like this lightning bolt, right, that's going to come down, you're going to meet the person, and that's going to be the person, and that's romantic love. And that's what I had with him, and still have. So now meet Rosa, my next-door neighbor, who's a young sculptor. How does she meet mates? Well... Let's assume she's met at least a 1,000 people, probably more than I had met, right? And then there's the millions she can meet online. Right, so however does she sort through them? 
Well, there isn't this lightning bolt of romantic love, right? There's this more information, more people, more choices, more faster, more. So she does speed dating, right? She goes to a bar and sits with 50 guys for two minutes each, and they write scorecards and evaluate each other and see who's going to date. Um, she uh, uses Friendster and Hot or Not and all those kinds of folks to, like, match up and do things like that. So completely different notion of how to go about what you might be going about. And here's the really interesting thing. The really interesting thing is when someone from a prior age, like this would be me, right, thinks about going to the new age, even if you can do it, right? I have a laptop, I have a cell phone, I don't file so well, but I do file, and I do search. I'm searching more and more these days. I file less. Joe keeps persuading me to file less and search more. Um, but we have a lovely friend, Felicia Mayro, who was sitting with us at dinner a couple of weeks ago. And over a glass of wine, we were, I was talking about this process of choosing mates differently. And at the end of it, she said, wait. She said, wait. And there was this long sort of pause. And she said, well, I did this speed dating thing. I got a friend who sort of bullied me into it. And, and then there was another really long pause. And she said, oh, I think I did it wrong. I was like waiting for the lightning bolt, right? And this was an information sort. This wasn't a lightning bolt. This was an information sort. Oh, so this is the kind of thing that happens when we're going between social systems, right? So you guys have customers in at least two of these, and maybe three, at least in Gesibershaft, the new one, at least in Gazelle Chef, the bureaucratic one, right? And I understand from somebody I met as I was trying to meet a few of you that you're extending into places where you might be actually in village society, right? So I want to encourage you to think about your customers, not just the physical stuff, but how do their brains work? What are their social systems like? How do they get status? What do they need? Because those things are different. They're really, really different. Another thing that's quite different that's hard for us to understand, and I want to use this as an example to talk about the fact that almost always between two social systems, people say, bad, easy, or sick. All right, so let me give you an example of this. In a village, as a person, you were a self. Self. Everybody knew you. Everybody knew pretty much all there was to know about you, right? You knew 150 other people. There you were. After we had the Industrial Revolution and moved to cities, we developed what we call multiple roles. So you're a parent and a worker and a churchgoer and a sports player. And, a, and some people know you only in one role. Right? And we developed something called role conflict. I should go home and be with my kids and now I should finish this report. Right? Village people don't understand this idea of roles and think it is literally genuinely crazy. As a person split up, must be sick or must be bad or must be not, not good, not good, not good. So what's happening now? What would be more complex, make use of more information? What's happening to people now? We are getting people with multiple role sets or multiple identity. Now, most people in bureaucratic times think of multiple identity in one of two ways. One schizophrenic, like sick, right? And the other, oh, like credit card theft or identity theft. I mean, why would you have more than one identity? And what Paul D. Spooky, uh, Paul D. Miller, who is a university professor in Europe, who is also a DJ, his other name is um, DJ Spooky, that subliminal kid, right? He has two complete identities, healthy adaptation, not for theft, not for, and he is a father, he has multiple roles, so he's a father's university president and a father as a DJ. And he says that he's a very different father when he's doing those two different things. 
So big change. I'm going to leave this area and I want to do that with just a little bit of summary of what's happening to our families. So it used to be that we had extended families and we had nuclear families. Now we're getting more and more autonomous, more and more separated. 26% and rising of us live in individual households. Children are being separated from being born into families. 50% in Sweden, 40% in France are born to people who have no conception of getting married. This, just so that you don't think it only happens in Europe, this young guy, his name is Brock, he has eight grandparents. So this is heartland of America, right, where every single grandparent has divorced at least once and married someone else. He's got eight grandparents. It's his own cheering section at his basketball teams. Our, na our notions of sexuality, <laughs> right? I mean, this is physically possible. So what happens to the dynamics of the family? So not only are we more resistant to authority in governments and in business, but look at this. The father should be in command in his house. This is in France. <coughs> over the period of since the information age was starting, going way down. And not just France, here's Canada, and here's the world. And what you're seeing here is the different rates of social change, right? Where is change happening faster and where is it happening slower? And not only in families, but in businesses and in governments. I'm going to not ask you to raise your hands, but how many of you think your government does exactly what it should be doing? So, that's enough examples. There are many, many, many. I have a huge model. Many examples. But I want you to be, when you're thinking about your customers, thinking about what age they're living in. And now I want to go back to my original question. My original question was, but okay, now I have this great model of social change, but what about community? All right, so think about community. So when in village life, you're born into a village, everybody's community was everybody else's community, 150 people approximately. Everybody knew everybody else. It just came like that. There's been some research, Dunbar says that we can understand the thinking intimately, that doesn't mean like, just understand the thinking of about 150 people maximum. So residual of village life. So now the villages get bigger. We move to cities. We move from place to place. Well, what happens to that community? Right? It starts to get separated Everybody's community is not everybody else's community now. So, if we just take me as an example, I have what I call remediated or changed community, which is my friends and family. Right? Those are the people who know me the best. Those friends and family are kind of like my village, only I carry it around on my back, or I go see them and we're not geographically contiguous. In fact, mine happens to be pretty spread around the world. So then I said, well, okay, well, what happens after the Industrial Revolution? What happens to community? So we've got these friends and family that we kind of, but where do we spend our attention? So I wanted to stop calling it community. I was going to call it primary groups. And then I found out that sociology said you had to, those had to be face-to-face. -face. So I call them primary attention groups. So where does my attention go? So it goes to friends and family. Then it goes associated to a new group, right? And that's to a bureaucracy of some kind. To a school, if I'm a kid, I'll be paying attention to my teacher and students, right, and fellow students. Or if I'm at work, to my boss and fellow workers. So those people are going to become very important in my life. That's a second category of people who become part of my primary attention group, the people I pay attention to. 
Now in the, in the new age, in Gesamtgesellschaft, there's starting to be a third category. And that category is a group of purpose. These are people not associated with my friends and family, not associated with my work or school, but people I know that I met at conferences, that I met wherever that I can stay in touch with because we have electronic communications that are an important part of my life. But it's a very different kind of group. So, I have a slide it says. Let's see what the slide says. Ah, so here's something that's very interesting. Remember the self in the village, right? Just one person. And here's the village remediated as friends and family. So that's how we interact. We interact with our friends and family sort of like we did when we were villagers. Now we have multiple roles and we interact with federations and bureaucracies in the roles, right? So at this level, we interact with multiple roles. So here, when we're starting to be multiple beings or multiple role sets, we start to interact with groups of purpose. So it's very interesting that we keep the characteristics from where it originated. All right, five, 10 minutes? Yeah, okay. Um, so when you think about groups, groups are changing. These new groups of purpose are very, very different from bureaucracies. And if you're gonna think about groups and how you're gonna sell to them or design products for them or, it's important to understand how different they are and it, they have different hierarchy. They do have hierarchy, but not the same and not very much of it. And a way to think about groups is to think about them the way biologists think about cells. So if you're going to think about a cell, a living social organism, right, a living organism, what a biologist does is look at the boundary of the cell, at the parts of the cell, so, you know, the nucleus and the chloroplast and all the kinds of things that might be in the cell. So when you think about a group, think about who are the people that make up the group. Because in a group of purpose, they might be around the world. In a bureaucracy, they're probably either officially employed or they're a citizen of a state. Right? In a village, they're tied to the, to the geography. What processes does the group use, just like a cell? What kind of architecture is there? All of that will tell you how to think about the group. So let me give you a couple of examples of the new groups of purpose that are emerging. One is terrorists, right? They work very, very differently from bureaucracies. Their primary form of governance is trust. They don't have a lot of hierarchy, but they do have hierarchy. Some, they're very, very careful about who comes in. Another group of purpose would be, oh, let's see, young pioneers. These are folks from 25 to 35 around the world who are assisting each other in validating their own interpretation of the world. Not what somebody said in a book, not what a boss told them, not what a teacher told them, but how they interpret the world. And they're using that to support each other. Another group of purpose was born when two military colonels in the US Army met over a backyard fence. They are all formed around purpose, these groups. So their purpose, they were talking across the fence, they were saying, you know, we're about to go to war. We've been to school, but we've never been in combat, and we don't want to die ourselves, nor to have the people that we're leading die. It's a pretty serious purpose. And so we're concerned about doing this right. And they started an informal organization, which eventually had a website. They started sharing experiences. They got experienced commanders to talk to them. They did a number of things. The Army thought this was a great idea, but the Army is a bureaucracy. The Army started to fund it, but then wanted to, wanted to organize and run the group the way the Army wanted it run, right, with the same measurements and the same efficiency and the same standards. And the folks said, no, this is our group. We're not run for efficiency, we're run for effectiveness, and if you want to stop giving us money, that's okay, but we're going to go off and do what we're going to do. So groups of purpose are not very controllable. 
They're very, very different from bureaucracies. <clears throat> okay. Yes? Which group? Sorry, the Army one? I, I think it's command, but if you give me your card, I'll, I'll email you. Um, and there's a nice case study of them. So, um, yes? I was wondering if you have uh, data about the uh, correlation of the size of groups versus the uh, structure as well. And that space we get. Groups of purpose sounds pretty useful for these are disorganized on a smaller scale. Yeah, right. and right well the first thing is no I don't have a lot because they're just emerging groups are the last thing to emerge in a new uh, social situation here's what I can tell you there's obviously a correlation in village with size right I mean there's just a very clear correlation with that in bureaucracy what we're finding is that there is a correlation between bureaucratic effectiveness Bure by the way, bu bureaucracies are really good at some things. They're very good at standardization. They're very efficient. Um, what has happened is that they're not very good in times of high complexity and high change. So in the 80s, you started to see reorganize, 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 outsource, insource, outsource, insource, as bureaucracies really started to try to grapple with the complexity and the speed of change and the too much information. They just couldn't do it. So I don't know yet about groups of purpose because it's too early. What I can tell you is I've seen some global ones. The largest one that I've studied is about 8,000 people. Um, but it's so much early days. If you were to look at England in, say, 1780, the bureaucracies you'd see would be five people, right? So it's, it's you know, don't know yet is the answer. Um, one of the really exciting things, I'm, I'm sort of a sociologist geek. Um, and, and I get really excited by sociological things. And one of the really neat things about groups of purpose is that they are the first living system to actually be able to change their structure. So I have watched a group of purpose get larger and larger, get more and more funded. Actually, I'm sorry, I, I know one other group of purpose that's larger than 8,000. Um, <clears> that formed a bureaucratic arm. So they can consciously choose different kinds of organization. The thing about bureaucracies is that bureaucracies have never learned how to do that. All they do is try to make it the bureaucracy better, right? <clears throat> better, 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 better. But they don't do a completely different kind of organization. Groups of purpose are not actually incorporating different kinds of organization within themselves. It's like a dog became a bird. It's really amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. bureaucracies think they should live forever. Groups of purpose think they should live for however long the purpose is. Right, so I've seen some that are a couple of weeks, I've seen that are a couple of months, some that are going on, yeah. So I want to contrast two ideas. One is, what about like the IRA? Uh-huh. They established a political branch. Right. Like, bureaucracy right. At the same time, kind of splinter. The other is um, like groups like Move On. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. And so give me a question there. Well, so the question is, if the IRA was, has been around for 100 years, yep. then this is something that's not really new, but it's become more than now. The, the IRA actually has pretty strong hierarchy. Um, so it's, it's more, like a, more like a bureaucracy. Um, the thing about it is that these distinctions are fluid, right? It's, it's not that nobody ever met ever in the world and for a purpose, right? I mean, that's, it's not like that. So they're pretty fluid. But, but the older ones, even like social clubs, during the period of bureaucracy, if you look at women's groups, they're hysterical. They elect a president, right? They have a secretary and a treasurer. and I mean, they make a bureaucracy because that's how groups work. Um, so, and one of the studies that I do that we certainly don't have time for today is contrasting the Society for Organizational Learning with the Rotary Club. Right? I mean, they both have purposes, 
but the Society for Organizational Learning is, is completely different in its fluidity and how you join it and what it does. And the Rotary Club is a bureaucracy. And it's interested in the standardization and efficiency. And you join the Rotary by role, as opposed to you can only join it if you're a professional or a business person and like that. Yeah. Ah, well that's a really long discussion and a couple of bottles of wine, but let me say this, okay? I think that you could make the case for groups and individuals in society generally moving up Maslow's hierarchy. Do you know Maslow's hierarchy? Okay. So if you look at hunting and gathering is survival. If you look at agriculture is then insurance or level two, right, ensuring that you'll have it. Level three is bureaucracy where we're going to be more formal and more automated and like that. Level four is where I believe we are now, which is responsibility and status. So we see a ton of status stuff around the world, right, and, and why a lot of people do things is for status, not for money necessarily. If you look at the open source movement, if you look at a lot of things, right, it's around status. It's not around money. The other thing is that we are a number of people pretty focused on responsibility. Now, we might disagree on what that responsibility might be for. So terrorists may very well be focused on responsibility. Um, and um, because we've now seen the world very clearly as a pretty closed system, we get some energy from the sun and you know some occasional meteors and stuff, but basically we're a pretty closed system. And we understand that if we don't clean up the system, we're all going to die. You know, so so there's some responsibility in that area as well. So I think you could make that case. Yeah. So um, you, you mentioned open source, but would you then say that open source and media, Linux, blogosphere, you know, is that the groups of purpose model versus well, Microsoft? <laughs> well, Microsoft's pretty clear your bureaucracy, which is not to say that you might not have some groups of purpose inside or some communities of interest. And the distinction I make between a community of practice, some of you may know communities of practice, where people get together because they're interested in the same things and they do the same kind of thing, is that that's an interest group. Uh, uh, the, one of the distinctions is the group of pur purpose has to be able to do something, to accomplish something. And a lot of communities of practice don't do that. Uh, so some of them are and some of them are not. Some of them are just large associations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So are you making that case that the, the, the corporate model will change as we know it from what we're I am. I am. And that eventually it will be a, a mix of product both, uh, and, and as we move forward. Yeah. I, I don't believe that bureaucracy will go away because it's good at, at some things, right? Um, so I don't think it will go away. I do think it will get remediated or changed a little bit, and I think that it will get enveloped in. Right. Not by social and yeah. business change. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Relative markets only make sense yeah. in, the, in the context of scarcity. Yeah. Then the you know, markets don't make sense for information economy. As yeah. information economy is uh, closer and closer, you know, you're developing everything. Right. And then markets make less and less sense. Well, and I'm, I'm not sure, I don't know what I think yet about markets, because I think markets are pretty efficient, but it's a very interesting thing, this notion of how different information is from a piece of coal. It is very different. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I, I guess my my point being that with your, your discussion that business will change. Yeah. But uh, uh, there's also a line of thinking that business, business as business will uh, disappear. There is that line, and I'm not convinced. But you know, who knows? So. This is great, and I'm loving your questions, and I want a whole bunch of more, so don't go away. I'm going to like finish this up, and then let's have a ton of questions. And I'm happy to stay and chat about most anything. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I want to talk about what I think Microsoft's karma is in all this. And I'm really serious about this. I take this really, really very seriously. 
you and not only you, other folks as well, but by each social age tends to automate the prior social age, right? So farming automated hunting and gathering by putting the crops and animals where we could find them. And then we worked really hard and then manufacturing automated most, not all, but most physical labor, right? I believe that what we're doing now is automating all the social processes that we developed during the, during the manufacturing age. We're automating them. So here's the thing, folks. This is so incredibly powerful. This isn't just going to affect you and your children and their children. This is going to shape societies for centuries, really for centuries. And I, I encourage you to take this seriously because it makes a huge, huge difference how you do it. How you do it is going to make an enormous, enormous difference to how all of humanity lives in the future. So if we just take here, for example, if we think about the early bureaucracies, right? They were little, they didn't do a whole lot, then they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now they basically run the world, right? I mean, you know, who's, what's the most powerful in the world? The government's not as powerful as the big businesses. Big businesses run the world. Those, what happens is that human beings iterate. We go over and over and over and over and over again. And at the time of social change where we are now, that order sort of breaks apart and we create new order. Right? While we're broken apart, while you guys are automating this stuff, we really need to be thoughtful about how we automate it so that it works well. I have a friend who studies uh, social change in Russia. And he went to the heartland of Russia to try to understand why capitalism and other kinds of things that were, people were actively working on weren't happening as fast as people might have expected in this heartland of Russia. And he's, they were saying, well, you know, people have to pay for what they get. And if they don't have anything to pay with and they don't get it, well, here's the thing. When Russia built the things that heat houses and apartments, in middle Russia, there's no turnoff valve for each apartment. You can't turn off the heat in one apartment. You either heat the whole building or nothing. Right? And that's shaped how the society is. To me, it's such a beautiful, concrete example of how the infrastructure drives something. So that when people are talking about social responsibility, they say, well, you know, you can turn off the whole building if I don't pay my, my heat bill, but, you know, then everybody freezes. And the amount of money to reconfigure that is way beyond the resources they have. So I think what you're doing, and I really seriously believe this, I think what you're doing is automating and providing all of the infrastructure for how human beings are going to be. So I love word to death and make it do things that you guys have never imagined. And um, cut and paste was not, were not words that I knew when I grew up, right? That was not part of the vocabulary. And yet now it shows up in my poetry, and it's a way of thinking. It changes us. It's not just some tool out there. It's some tool in here. And it changes how we interact with each other. So, you know, for my two cents, if you can really help... So there are bad sides to each one of these things. Like, so here, right, there wasn't a lot of freedom. What's the downside? What's the downside in Gesellschaft where there's bureaucracy? You become a cog in a wheel and you don't really get to contribute and it's frustrating and, you know, you become a part. What's the likely downside here? So much information that you can't find yourself. You're diffused. You can't figure out who you are. We see kids staying home. Uh, with their parents later and later and later in life because they can't figure out who they are and what they want to do. Yeah. Oh, worse than that. Too much awareness. We know how small you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you know. Absolutely. So I have for you, after we're done, a poem that I wrote when I was at Citibank when we were developing the first automated voice response um, that I hope you'll enjoy. Take off take away with you. And I have another challenge. <clears throat> so it's not like these are single cause and effect. But here's the thing. 
Remember the, the biological time periods? It was 300 million years for early life and then 250 for fish. And so they get shorter, right? So it was 10,000 years for agriculture and 250 years for bureaucracy. So they're going to come faster and faster and faster. And we're all going to have to learn how to deal with them. It used to be that we had sort of the luxury, if you will, of the old folks dying off and the new folks going on. But they're going to be now multiple in our lifetime. So we're going to need to learn how to deal with these. And my question to you is, what's going to trigger this? What's the next trigger? Is it China and India? Is it nanotechnology? Is it cloning and really long human life? What is it? And Tam said she might set up a wiki or something so you guys can vote and choose and think about what you think it might be. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence? That's certainly a candidate. Yep. So I think I'm about at, I have a toy for all of you. We'll do that in just a minute. So basically, I talked a little bit about the shape of social change. I'll be a really happy camper if you just come away with some shapes in your mind of how society changes, some ideas of how you might look at your customers differently, how you might think about their capacities, their wants, their needs, their social interactions. And if you take this karma bit seriously, then I'm like a really happy camper. And I have really enjoyed, and I'm gonna hang around, so this is not like me going away forever. Here's how to, oh, no, 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 last close, sorry. So pictures to take away in your mind. This is historic preservation. This Washington, George Washington used this as his headquarters during the Revolutionary War, one of the places he used as his headquarters. It was one of the first buildings ever saved for historic preservation. And it was saved under a Gemeinschaft or a village sort of notion of touch magic. He was there, we can go there, and that makes it important. We can see what it was like. After we had the manufacturing age, we started saving different kinds of buildings. We started saving beautiful examples, high design, good manufacturing, good in industry, good architecture, right? Well, hold on to your socks. Look at what we're saving now. The U.S. government has this ghost house of Benjamin Franklin. This is in Philadelphia. I kid you not. You can go see it. This is a virtual preservation if I ever saw one, right? There's no building here. They just know that Benjamin Franklin's house was there, but they don't know what it looked like. And so instead of what we would have done, right, we would have done a Disney World kind of thing, right? We would have made something up, and folks could have gone. We are really going far away from the physical. We are going away, away, away from the physical. So that's my image for you to have in your mind. And I'm going to take lots of questions. I'm going to give you contact. That's how to find me. I am delighted to be here. Would love to come back. Would love to work with you guys. And I have toys. So now this is going to be like really messy. But you're just going to come up and take one of these. You're going to all come up here and pick a color. The colors don't mean anything. I'm going to go. Come on. <laughs> Any color you want. <laughs> just one. Well, I'm going to tell you about the toy in just a minute. You have to have it first. Oh, say if you would. It would be great. And this is about it. But I can't have it for just a minute. Have to have the toy first. <laughs> yeah, in a minute. In a minute. So this is a Kelter rattleback, and I'm going to have somebody do a demo so you can kind of like hang around so you can see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sure. Very good, thank you. I love it when people have good questions. <laughs> 
So while the last of the folks are getting these, you can think at about a thousand words a minute. But people can only talk at about 150, or if you're from New York, about 200. So it's good to doodle with your hands. You'll actually listen better. So when your kids doodle, give them a pen, tell them, go to it. Right? All right, so now I need somebody to demo this. Can you come demo? All right, so I want you, you're going to have to see, you have to stand up. All right, so I want you to spin it in a direction, any direction. Uh huh. It didn't want to go in that direction, and it turned around and went the other way. Do it again. She's tricking me. Nope. Turn around the other way. Now go, turn it the way it wants to go. Turn it the way it wants to go. There you go. Likes that way. Now stop it and tap it on an end. Oh, sorry. Like this. Oh. See? It goes in the direction it wants to go, right? You just give it a little tiny tap, and it'll go in the direction it wants to go. So this is a Celt or a Rattleback. I'm going to give it to you to play with, while on your, well, play with while you're on the phone so you can pay attention to whoever you're talking to and to remember me and invite me back. Um, but mostly because just like you can't see why this would go one direction and not the other, you cannot see social systems. But they are there. I promise you they are there. And you know what? If you try to make them go in the direction they don't want to go, you can. You absolutely can, but it'll cost you time and money, and it'll be frustrating, and it'll be just annoying all the way around. It'll be very, very expensive. Or you can work with them, and it'll be faster, easier, cheaper, more fun. And knowing my audience, I have a card about the physics. So, that <laughs> so there you go. And I'm going to give you too many. I'm not going to count. Just pass the end ones down. And I have a poem, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Just pass that way, which I gave you enough for. <clears throat> Oh. You're welcome. You have? You have. You have. Just, I'm not going to count these, so like stick them at the end so that I don't waste all this paper. There you go. Yeah, they're very chancy times, very, very tumultuous because we don't do everything that we used to do, right? I mean, we used to know how to do it, and we just did it that way. You guys have got? Absolutely. Yep. Sure, can I repeat the question? The question was, um, preceding these social revolutions, um, there was a lot of turmoil and, and change, and, and yeah. It's almost like a, it's a prerequisite. I mean, it's it's a prerequisite. So my, I guess it's not really a question, but whatever that next step is in the information revolution, I mean, we might be in that. Um, is really in a way it's competing worldviews and competing um, sort of. I, I'm not sure. I, there's a word for it, but it's not jumping my right now. This is Monday. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, where, you know, for example, certain countries have shut down their, their access to cyberspace. They only want a certain kind of view of right. what the world is. Um, even within communities, there, there are various bloggers who are each trying to establish like, their turf and their right. information. Um, so, what do you think will come out of that? Well, <laughs> well I don't know who wins. Um, so, you're, you're absolutely right. And if you think about a social system that's very tight, and very regular, right? That's not when it's going to happen. It only happens when it starts to, to break and judder. That doesn't mean people necessarily want it. It just means that the social system is not adapted to the environment. It's in an environment that isn't working well, right? So it's not like people said, oh, let's have an information revolution. It's that we made all these wonderful things, 
found ourselves completely immersed and the things that we did before didn't work anymore. And, you know, then people start trying to do new things. Yeah. So are all the instances of these revolutions by technological change or are there any other things? <clears throat> so the question was, are all of these changes, have they all come from technological change? And the answer is no, and I haven't done a complete study. So my, my notion is that the, the more recent ones certainly have been. Um, <clears throat> And it depends on what you call technology, right? So if you think of planting as technology, you know, and I tend to think of ways of thinking as technology, actually. So I would kind of say yes to, yeah. Yeah. So what's the purpose of your work? What do you want to achieve? And what's your recommendation of, or uh, like information industry uh, should do or any, any model in your mind? What's the purpose of my work? What do I want to achieve? Well. The first thing that I really, really want to achieve is to help people who are on two sides of any social revolution stop looking at each other and saying bad or sick, right? To say maybe we disagree, that's okay. But so that's, that's really one of the first purposes. And, and in that regard, if you can stop talking this is the right process, and move to what's the value. Because often we share a value, but we disagree on, on what the process is. So to give you a really concrete one, right? long-term marriage, my 34-year marriage, is very, very important to me. And I think of that as a good way to have love, intimacy, a partner, somebody I can count on, uh, like that. right? It's very unlikely, I just went to my nephew's wedding, it's very unlikely that he will have a 34-year marriage. I mean, you just look at the statistics, it's not very likely. And the speed of change and the fact that we have multiple careers and we're going to live longer and longer and longer, maybe even means that however much I value that marriage, it might have been, maybe I missed something, right, by not having two or three, maybe, don't know. So instead of saying marriage is the way to do it, right, for me to say that to my nephew, I might be able to say, well, I think it's really important in, in a human life to have love and intimacy. What do you think and how might you get that? Right? So that the process may fit the environment. But if you move the discussion to value, so that's my first objective. And your second question, if you would ask again. Any, uh, do you recommend, as Microsoft, we should uh, help to automate oh. the, the process? Anything that in your mind that, uh, that, that we can do? Better in that, uh, area. Well, bless your heart. Um, that's a really big question, and although I have posed it to you, I have not spent a significant enough time from, for myself to think about it, but it's a really great question, and I am going to think about it some more. And I hope you guys will think about it. I mean, you're here, and you're doing it, so. Awareness yeah, awareness is a lot of it, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> you there is a lot of differences Yeah. The what, what struck me is how, how similar they are. That yeah. Virtual communities tend to have approximately the number of um, active participants. That, right, that 150, knowledge, uh, 150, right. Just in our <coughs> latest reorg last week, we were going <laughs> basically you know, segmented into village size yeah. chunks. Uh, you mentioned the communities of purpose tend to go away when the purpose is gone, but what I've noticed that a lot of these things, the, uh, they seem to be as resistant to extension as, as bureaucracies. Uh, some online mailing lists or whatever, they'll, they'll mutate. The, the purpose or the apparent purpose or the right. focus of the discussion will, will mutate. I've been sort of around some you know, strange attractor, if you will. But, uh, yeah. um, but anyway, I, I was just wondering what you responded. Okay, so to try to summarize that for the camera. Um, it's, it's the more, more yeah, the more they're the same. Yeah. Well, first of all, there are a number of pretty well researched limitations to our brain in social action, and there are some people who believe that this will change, but I haven't seen any evidence of it yet. So the 150 is only one of them, right? 
Another one is that we can deal effectively only with seven layers of hierarchy. It doesn't mean we don't make more, it just means we're not capable of dealing effectively with more than seven. Um, <clears throat> we can remember about 450 faces, so if you're a genius, 500, but, you know, not 2,000. I think, you know, that's biologically determined, right? And, and we have a lot of, you know, we meet virtually, but we still want to meet in person. We want to see each other. We want to sniff. We want to do all those kinds of things because we're biological animals. One of the questions for me is as we become more cyborg-like, um, will we actually change that? You know, people speak of their uh, PDAs or phones or whatever as their brains or, you know, and, and I certainly, you know, if I lose it, I'm handicapped. Um, so as we move, you know, the next steps and we get artificial intelligence, we do some of the things I don't know. But for now, there are some very consistent patterns that we don't overcome, that don't change. Yes? Ooh, what a great question. So what are some advancements that intrigue or frighten me? <clears throat> Consolidations of the ability to restrict information or to construct information or to regulate flows frighten me. One of the things that doesn't frighten me that frightens a lot of people is the whole issue of privacy. Uh, I'm a very gazelle-shaft person in, in that regard. I value my privacy a lot, but most very young people that I know really don't care at all. And I think, I've given some thought to it, I don't know that this is the reason. My work is observational, I don't always know what causes things. Um, I think that it's, there's just so much information that you just lose it and no, nobody cares anymore. I mean, if you think about my mother would have died rather than say some of the things that people compete to get on Oprah to say, right? <laughs> I mean, they're like trying to get up there to let it all hang out. And my mom would have closed the curtains, nailed the door, and, you know. So our, our concepts change. What else frightens me? Um, well, let me say what excites me. What excites me is the, the increasing connectivity um, the, you know, Bill Gates was at Howard, I guess, last week or the week before anyway, and, and he was talking about, you know, sort of ubiquitous linking and, and uh, wireless. Um, that, that excites me. And I have to say that 20 years ago, it frightened me. So that's actually, that's very interesting. So 20 years ago, I was at Citibank. I was actually managing some software development. And I hired someone who who said to me in the interview, he wanted to be wired in. He wanted to be physically jacked in. And it scared me. It was repellent. It was frightening. I thought, I, ugh, right? So now, if I can't find wireless and I'm not effectively wired in, I'm like an unhappy camper. Right? So isn't that interesting how that changes, right? So the, the more sharing... Um, the more, the more I see children use technology to help other children. I'm, I'm actually teaching in Connecticut um, an undergraduate course because I wanted to see, it's called the decision-making groups, and I wanted to see how not special kids, not at Harvard, not at, you know, were actually making decisions and what they were doing. And it's fascinating to see how much better they are at it than without any training at all. They're just better at working together. Not perfect, but better at it when they come into the classroom from the very beginning than people were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. So things that connect us I love, things that I, and however bad I'm at it, I love the search stuff. And the fact that phone calls are gonna be digital and be searchable, I think is gonna change a lot of stuff. I don't know what it's gonna do, but it's gonna be really interesting. Um, I love pictures, I love, you know, I mean, wh I wouldn't have seen my grandniece, you know, literally wet and moving in her mom's arms, even 10 years ago. I wouldn't have seen that on the same day, you know. I love that stuff. 
I love the power of scenario, scenarioing and gaming. I think gaming can be used for so many really powerful and good things. Um, yeah, I like a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 Can you give some other examples of uh, groups of purpose and possible bureaucracy that they are uh, either challenging or replacing or augmenting? Well, company commander would be one um, that is being much more effective in some areas than the U.S. Army for sure. Um, MAD is, is a little bit hybrid, but more towards, and remember that there are not really clean lines, and particularly in times of transition. Um, I don't, you know, that's an interesting question. I don't have a lot that are really parallel. I will think about that. If you give me your card, I'll, I'd, I'd like that. That's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Could you give some more examples of social processes that you see are going to start becoming automated? I mean, not, not e-communication, right? That's a good thing. But what are some of the other ones that you just see as <clears throat> Sorry? Yeah, screening calls. Uh, so the question was, what are some of the processes that are getting automated or just starting to get automated? So um, a lot of um, reminder, multitasking things, and particularly for people like me who aren't very good at it, Right, I, it gets easier and easier and easier for me to do more and more things. I also get tired and need to go off and meditate or do something like that. But I see a lot of that. I see um, security. Um, well, you see things like tracking children. You see things like guarding buildings. You see things like so the whole process of security, uh, in some ways, is getting automated. You see, um, yeah. For sure, personal organization. What else do you guys see that's getting automated? Mail filters. Mail, mail filters, yep, filtering of all kinds. I think uh, like purchasing, like that, where you'll actually, not so much like home grocery, but having autonomous agents yeah. that make decisions on your behalf. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mate selection, friend selection, um, expert selection, um, what else? Um, personality. Personality. Well, words, yeah. Your yeah, your presence. Your presence, for sure. If you think about people now, assessment being as important as achievement, your ability to present yourself on the net, pretty big deal. Okay. What else? Actually, social norms. Social norms. <coughs> yeah. Multiply that by some effect on your, you know, your online presence that prevents you from gaps. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, that kind of thing. And and gaming, I think gaming is a is a place where you start to see that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, gaming and assessment, uh, your confidence in the game is really yeah. final judge, and you have and and the, the correlative is a great leveling age. You may yeah. Have a Huge leveling, huge, huge, huge leveling, huge connecting, yep. Um, increasing choice, increasing, increasing, increasing choice, yeah. Um, I also wanted to follow <coughs> up on your assessment versus achievement. Yeah. Uh, when you originally talked about it, 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 there's always a saying, you know, perception is reality, <coughs> and I don't see that as having really changed <coughs> So I didn't quite get Okay, so, so here would be the difference. You're right. What, what people understand is what you get, right? I mean, that's just for sure the case. But when, I, when you would interview, ah, here's a good one. So teaching college, right? I have a young friend who's just starting, who's a full-time professor. Her father was a full-time professor. He got his degrees, you know, got his thing, and that was sort of, done. He published his two books, and he was achievement, and that was it for life. Right? Now, his daughter has got a degree and is doing his publishing, but she gets assessed by students. He didn't get assessed. Students didn't do assessments. 
right? We didn't have 360 degree feedback. We didn't have customers assessing. So it's, it's you know, you can't say, about customer, I have an MBA from Harvard. Just to say, I don't care, your service doesn't work, right? So, do you see the difference? Yeah. So I, I understand the term assessment, but I'd almost say reputation is, is like a slightly different way of looking at it. Yeah. Especially if you're looking at different spheres of influence. Um, if you're a rock star, that might not mean anything to someone at Harvard. Absolutely. But it might mean a whole lot to their daughter. Right. Right. Or something like that. I think that, like, when you bubble up, like, in Korea, video game, like, the top video game players are, like, are the equivalent. They're yeah. celebrities. Absolutely. Um, Bill Gates is a celebrity, not because he plays guitar terribly well, but because, yeah. you know, of other spheres. Yeah. And the way that they come together, I think, is going to be, there's lots of little pieces. You get little, like, plus one mod here, minus two mod there. Oh, what an there's interesting idea. Oh, what a cool idea. Yeah. How they all kind of co-mingle. So I think that different people will assess you differently. Absolutely. Based upon what they value. Yeah. And so different ratings. If yeah. Someone that's in a death metal band, if you don't like death metal, you might give them like huge negatives. Right. But if you do, you might like yeah. make the world yeah. a Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and end there. If you have any further one-on-one -on -one questions or you want to chat with Mary Ann, we'll, we'll be around in the next 10 or 15 minutes. So thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to talk to you.